Okay, let's see the Bibles this morning. Word. Let's see your pens. Pens. And let's see your bulletins. Bulletins. Um, I want to, I have a prayer request. We have a young man in our church. Um, his name is Garrett, and he um, was shot in the eye with a BB gun last night, and we were at the hospital with him. Um, and we need to pray for a miracle and that God would do an amazing thing, save his eye, uh, and not only amazing thing with his eye, but with his family. God is moving in his family. He's blessed them, and he is really encouraging them through this. But they're here every week, and uh, it w it w my wife and I were there last night um, and, and early into the morning. My wife was there early into the morning, and, and to just pray that God would do what the doctors have admitted they can't, which is save his eye. And so let's pray right now for that. Lord, we just lift up Garrett to you. And Lord, it was just so encouraging to see him lay there hours with no painkiller, no medicine, with a BB in his eye, and his eye bleeding. He just laid there and was thanking me for being there and wiping the blood off his face and just so respectful and so patient. And uh, Lord, I, we just pray that you would do what the doctors can't and that save his eye, that he would be able to see that when they take the bandages off after the surgery, they would realize that what has resulted from the surgery was not what they intended. It was even better. We pray you give his mom, his dad, his brothers, sisters, incredible peace through this. Can keep him strong. Um, I thank you for his mom giving testimony of how much peace she had supernaturally through this. And I pray you lift her up, keep her strong. In Jesus' name, amen. Excuse me. Turn to, please, Luke. Luke. Don't come over to the dark side. Luke 18. <laughs> Luke says in verse 1 then he spoke a parable to them that men always ought to pray and not lose heart if you're a visitor or you're just sporadic attender we have been we're in the middle of a, a towards the end of a series on prayer and obviously this one is about what Jesus just said in verse 1 or Luke says he spoke a parable to them, and the reason why, that men always ought to pray and not lose heart, saying, there was a certain city, there was in a certain city a judge who did not fear God nor regard man, nor there was, now there was a widow in that city, and she came to him saying, get justice for me from my adversary, and he would not for a while, but afterward he said within himself, Though I do not fear God nor regard man, yet because this widow troubles me, I will avenge her, lest by her continually, continual coming, she wear me out. Basically, this dude is a, is a he's a uh, pagan, non-God fearing, not just grumpy old judge. Women had no, they were less than lower, second class. And he says, I don't need to listen to you, lady. Get out of here. But he said, you know what? She is driving me crazy. And so what I'm going to do is I'm going to give her what she wants just so she don't come back. That's what he said. Okay? Look what it says in verse 6. Jesus said, hear what the unjust said. Judge said, shall not God avenge his own elect who cry out day and night to him, though he bears long with them? I tell you that he will avenge them speedily. Nevertheless, when the Son of Man comes, will he really find faith on earth? Very simple story. Is that this guy 
didn't care about people, didn't care about this woman, didn't, he, he didn't care. He do, does what he wanted to do. He wasn't going to give her justice. But because she bugged him and bugged him and bugged him and bugged him and bugged him, he finally said, all right, here. And then Jesus says, hey, listen, if this guy who's evil would give her what she wanted because she bugged him, how much more your God in heaven who's righteous bless his children who he loves if they ask him? That's the story. It's very simple. If you do this, then I'll do this. But look what it says at the very end. The very end it says, verse 8, I tell you that he will avenge them speedily. Nevertheless, when the Son of Man comes, will he find anybody who does this? Will he find anybody on earth who, will he find anybody on earth who has faith? What's going to make this church and any church effective in really accomplishing accomplishing its mission? mission? Our mission is to evangelize everybody in San Diego which means that we're going to give everybody in San Diego a genuine opportunity to be saved. That's what we're here for. Miles ahead is kids around the world. If that's going to happen, it's only going to happen when all of y'all who call this your church walk by faith. Coming to church requires basically no faith. Heathens come to church. But stepping out and saying, God, I want to be used is where faith comes in. And God's saying, here, look, if you do this, I'll do this, but... I don't know if I ever find anybody who's going to be, trust me. That's what he's saying. Will you ever trust him? I was at a conference yesterday in, in L.A. at the Forum, and I was a prayer and fasting conference. Thousand people, 2,000 in the Forum. It was very sad. Came to this prayer and fasting. Rick Warren from Saddleback spoke, and the, he spoke two speakers before me. Then right before me, a pastor named Kenneth Omer spoke, Bishop Omer, and his church owns the forum. I don't know if you knew that the LA, the Great Western Forum was sold to a church. Well, he's the pastor of the church who bought it. And the night before he closed escrow, the night before he had to make the final payment to, to get it, and he was short. And he was raising money. It was $22.5 million. They were raising all this money, and he needed a little more money, and he was all tapped out. And the another developer was going to make it houses. He had his bulldozers on the property. <laughs> Tell me that brother wasn't praying. Do you hear what I'm saying? You raise all this money, you're going to buy the form. And I'm talking about this is a dream come true, okay? This, I, I, can, I, I feel the brother's pain. And the developer who says, you ain't raising the money. Told his bulldozers, go on site because tomorrow we're breaking ground for our project. And God came through. Last minute. Amen. We don't want to go down that route, though, y'all. <laughs> but he was praying. He was preaching. And he, and he, and this dude, I love to hear this dude preach. There's a verse in Second Chronicles 7, 14. It says, if my people who are called by my name will humble themselves and pray, and turn from their wicked ways, then I will hear their land. Now listen, he says, if you do this, then I do this. It's an if-then proposition. An if-then. If your enemies come to you and you call me, then I will hear you. If you sin, then you will pay consequence. If you repent, then I'll forgive you. This is very simple here. If you pray continually, stuff, then stuff will happen. If you don't, then stuff won't happen. What you want to do? What you want to do? You, 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 got, you need something to happen in your life? Well, if you do this, then this will happen. If you don't, then this won't. That's it. Cool, cool. My friend in college used to do that. Every time something would happen, it was like his punchline. Cool, cool. That's it. Okay. Now, I want to ask you a question. I want you to think about this. This is a... Uh, 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 I want you to think. As I'm asking you this question, I want you to be searching your knowledge of the Bible, see if you can come up with a with a an answer to it. Not an answer, but th- just evaluate this. Every time Jesus did a miracle, do you ever remember Jesus doing a miracle and praying real long? Huh. He storm. He would go be muzzled. Just like that. 
Little girl was dead. Talitha Kumai. Girl raised up. Raised from the dead. Lazarus was dead four days. Lazarus, come forth. Lazarus got up. Demon, come out of him, you deaf, dumb spirit, and enter him no more. 17 words in the New King James. Demon comes out. Over and over and over. Matter of fact, Jesus would heal people sometimes. He didn't have to pray at all. Matter of fact, there were times Jesus healed people. He didn't even acknowledge that they were there because he didn't see them. Remember the, girl, the woman who came, she had the issue of blood. She came behind him and touched the edge of his clothes. And the Bible says, he says, who touched me? Because he felt power go out of him, turned around, and there she was. He didn't even know she was there. Why is that? How could a guy go around and go, whap, 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 whoosh, y'all are healed, whoosh, y'all are healed. How? Do, do you understand what I'm saying? Think of, let's think about that. I, 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 I don't know if y'all, y'all understand what I'm telling you. Let's think about that for a minute. The dude was crippled 38 years. He says, do you want to be well? He says, oh, you know, I, don't, I don't have anybody help me with water. Jesus says, yes or no? He said, Get up and take your mat. He didn't even pray. He just spoke it. Get up and take up your mat. The dude got up. Just like that. Why is that? How is it that? Now you're saying, well, he was God. No, 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 no. He was all God, but he was all man. How is it that he did that? In other words, let me back up. What did he do in his life that we can do that will enable us to do what he did in his life? Because he said we would do the things he did and even greater things. So what is it that he did that enabled him to do this stuff so quick and easy that we're missing? Because sometimes we think we should be able to do it that quick and easy. Oh, God, heal this person. Oh, God, we did. Oh, and all our prayers are two minutes. Oh, oh God, bless my food. Oh, God, oh God, bless me. Oh, God, I have this big decision. Boom, boom, boom. And we just step. Oh, he's saying, no, no, you missing. He says, church, don't miss this part because there were many times I prayed all night. Early in the morning, we're going to see. Before the sun was up, throughout the whole night into the morning, I was with the Father. That's how. He built up the power. And he prayed and prayed and prayed and prayed all night. So when he came into the public, he was full of God. He was all prayed up. So when you need a little, little, little juice, my, when my kids are sick, they say, Dad, give me the juice. They want me to give them the Holy Ghost juice and pray for them and get them healed because they don't want to take medicine. So they say, give me the juice, Dad. And I just go, wow. Like, Come on, give me the juice. And I just kind of rub their head and, and pray for them. <laughs> but if I don't have the juice, I can't give it to them. Let's read some, let's read some verses here. Turn to, turn to Matthew chapter 4, verse 1. Matthew, we're going to look through the, through the Gospels. Matthew 4. Matthew 4, verse 1, 2, it says, Jesus was led by the Spirit into the wilderness to be tempted by the devil. This is when he's starting his ministry. The Bible says he fasted and prayed 40 days and 40 nights, and after, afterward he was hungry. Now, you ever read that and you go, he fasted 40 days and 40 nights, and then he was hungry? You go, duh. In reality, if you fast 40 days and 40 nights, after about three or four days, you don't get hungry anymore. That's true. I mean, you get a little bit of a little hungry. You just take some water and it's gone. But it's true. If you, if you can last that long mentally, physically it's not the problem. It's the mental. The Bible says he fasted four days. Before he started his ministry, what did he do? He fasted and prayed all alone for 40 days in the desert. Oh, you know how much power he had after that? Turn to Matthew chapter 14. Matthew 14, verse 23. After he fed the 5,000, it says, verse 23, he sent the multitudes away. He went up on a mountain by himself to pray. Now when evening came, he was alone, but the boat was now in the middle of the sea, tossed by the waves, for the wind was contrary. Now on the fourth watch of the night, Jesus went walking on the sea. He fed the 5,000. He sent his disciples into the boat, told them to go into the sea. He went by himself. 
Now imagine all the hoopla behind him getting all those people saved. Okay? I mean, he was the man. He said, okay, y'all get in the boat. Y'all go home. Y'all, hung, y'all fed now. Y'all get in the boat. Y'all go out there. I got to go pray. Prayed. I don't know what he prayed, but I have a theory that he prayed that the storm would come out onto the sea. That's just my personal theory. Doesn't mean anything. But it's ironic that he prayed. A storm came. They were in the middle of the sea going, oh, we're going to drown. And Jesus comes walking out in the water. I mean, that's not a coincidence to me. And then Peter walks on the water. So right before this miracle, he went to the mountain, prayed by himself. Look at Matthew 26, verse 39. Right before he was crucified, he prayed to prepare for difficult times. It says in verse 39, he went a little further and fell on his face and prayed, Oh, my Father, if it's possible, let this cup pass from me. Oh, my Father, I don't want to get crucified. I don't want to get nailed to the cross. I don't want to get my beard pulled out. I don't want to get my back whipped, thorns in my head. But then what he says, nevertheless, not my will, but as you will. Then he came to the disciples and found them asleep and said, Peter, what could you not watch with me for one hour? Think about it. Three years he spent discipling these guys, teaching these guys, going through all kinds of trials with these guys. He's getting ready to get killed. And he's over there praying, blood coming out of his head, sweat. These guys are falling asleep. You ever fall asleep talking to God? Anybody ever fall asleep talking to God? Be honest. Look at y'all. So can you imagine meeting somebody? How you doing? What's your name? Oh, my name is Miles. What's your name? Oh, Jim. How you doing? Hey, hey, man, you know, I go to your church, and, you know, I listen to your sermons. (laughs) 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 Is that what you do when you listen? (laughs) Oh, I'm sorry, man. You're just born. (laughs) Is that what you do to God? That's what you do to God? That's what they did. Peter, Jesus is like, man, would y'all get up? Couldn't y'all pray one hour? Get up. Man. He goes over here and prays again. He's on his face. He gets up again. Those are his disciples. Look at Mark chapter 1. He prayed a long time so he could know where to minister. Mark 1, 35, Matthew, Mark, Luke, John. It says, now in the morning, having risen a long while before daybreak. For some of y'all, that may be like five minutes before daybreak. (laughs) If it's dark, I'm sleeping. He went out and departed to a solitary place, and there he prayed. You know what a solitary place is? No phone. No computer buzzing in the background. No TV button anywhere within reach. Nobody can get to you. No food. Nothing. You are alone someplace. It is quiet. There is no prospect, potential of interruption. He says a long while before daybreak, that's when he did. And look what it says. And Simon and those who were were with him, searched for him. When they found him, they said, everyone's looking for you. He said, let us go to the next town that I may preach there because for this purpose I have come forth. That's how he knew. He knew that because he prayed and spent time, extended time in prayer. Look at um, Luke 6, 12. He prayed a long time so he can know who to choose for leadership. 612. It says, Now it came to pass in those days that he went out to the mountain to pray and continue all night in prayer to God. Ooh. And when it was day, he called his disciples to himself, and from them he chose 12 whom he named apostles. All night in prayer. 
You got a decision to make? Pray all night. Oh, man, it ain't that important. <laughs> well, your decision may not be that important, but what's, what's really important is that you get hear God on your decision. That's what's important. Hear God. So he, Jesus is saying, look, here's my, here's my parable, that you always ought to pray and not lose heart. Let's read the verse, chapter 18 of Luke. It says, the parable he spoke to them, that men always not ought, to, ought to pray and not lose heart. Luke 18. What a great sound. Hearing those pages turn. Verse 2. There was a certain judge who did not fear God nor regard man. Nor, and now there was a widow in that city. And she came to him saying, get justice for me from my adversary. Now, I've told you many times, don't ever pray for justice. Because you don't want to get what's fair. Because what's fair is that we all die and go to hell because we're the sinner and Jesus is not. But I'm going to change that just for this sermon. Because as a Christian and as someone who trusts God and who surrendered your life to God, guess what you have coming to you? Forgiveness. Power. The Bible says that you shall receive power when the Holy Spirit comes and you shall be his witnesses. The Bible says that if you call to him, he will tell you great and mighty things. These are your rights. The Bible says he will give you a love that is unsearchable, a love in your heart that will enable you to love even those who hate you. The Bible says he will, he will do exceedingly, abundantly more than you can ask or imagine if you trust him. These are your rights. As a Christian, I have access to supernatural things. I have access to spiritual gifts through which God, from, by which God can use to build his kingdom. These are my rights. These are what I have access to. And the only way I can get them is to bug him for them. That's a negative term, but to pray over and over and over and over again. And many of you have been saying, you know, Lord, I, I pray to you. I give my life to you, and I still have these problems. And what you're saying is that shouldn't my life be different? Shouldn't, my, shouldn't I have gotten over these problems? And God's probably saying, absolutely. But you know what you got to do? you got to pray more. Because if you're going to pray five minutes here, five minutes there, that's just not good enough. I want you to spend more time with me. Remember the first day we were talking about praying, I, I, I gave you an illustration of a man in the hospital who was sick, and his daughter sent the pastor up to see him, and he was talking to an empty chair. And he says, what are you doing? He says, well, Jesus is in the chair, and I'm trying to, help my prayer life by talking to the chair. Jesus is sitting there. He said, okay. Went, went away. The pastor came back. He had died and his head was in the chair. That's prayer. God wants you to put your head in his lap and hold you, talk to you, shape you, mold you, encourage you, love you, and he never wants you to stop. He doesn't want you to just hit and run. Give me this, God. Thanks a lot, God. I got a problem, God. I got to go. Okay. No, he's like, hey, 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 spend time with me. You remember when you first met your first honey? Whether it was, you know, boyfriend, girlfriend, spouse, whatever. You remember that? You talk for hours about nothing. And then you kind of, you know, you, you're holding the hand. You kind of, all right, I'll see you later. You don't want to let go. And then, and then you finally go, okay, see you later. What do you do? Well, back then, now you got cell phones, but when I was, you know, we didn't have cell phones, so we had to wait till you get home, and what do you do? You call them up. What are you doing? Uh, you just left. And then you talk some more. Then you get off the phone, and then you write a letter. Then you, then you get the letter, and you look at that picture. Then you smell the perfume. Then you go to bed, and you dream about it. Then you wake up, and you call them again. called love I guess that's what God wants to do God wants you to talk to him <laughs> talk to him talk to him talk to him talk to him because the more you talk to him he can shape you encourage you counsel you change you love you and let me tell you something you can never get enough of his love and counsel you can't 
You have to get to a point where you do nothing outside of God. That you are constantly trusting and depending on him. Look what the Bible says in verse 2. The Bible says in verse 2, 18, it says, There was a certain judge who did not fear God nor regard man. Now there was a widow in that city, and she came to him saying, Get justice for me from my adversary. And then in verse 4, He would not for a while, but afterward he said within himself, I do not fear God nor fear man, but because this widow troubles me, I will avenge her, lest her continual coming to me, she wearies me out, wears me out. Over and over and over and over. Some of us have kids like that. Dad, you said. Dad, you said. Dad, did you think about it? Dad, did you make a decision? Dad, what are we going to do? My, my, my middle daughter, she got like all A's and one B, I think it was, which is unbelievable. We were so proud of her. I said, man, Kimmy, you are the, you work so hard. You're so faithful. I want to get you something. What do you want? Oh, nothing. I was like, oh, I got I to gotta take advantage of this. Oh, I'll get you anything, Kimmy. I, I know she said, what do you want? You sure you don't want anything? Nothing. That's okay. I was like, all right. <laughs> she was setting me up. So I forgot about it. Hour later, she says, Dad, I thought of something I want. And I'm thinking, I thought we forgot about all. I thought you said nothing. I'm going on to the next thing. I said, what do you want? Um, can I have a cell phone? <laughs> so... Uh, I said, Kimmy, you know, um, let me think about it. Well, for the next 10 days or so, she didn't bug me. But, well, she didn't bug me like my other daughter would bug me, but she reminded me constantly. And this is how she reminded me. She would go, Dad, and she would do this. So that's her thing now. I said, Kimmy, give me that. Give me that. She goes. It's like automatic. Bam. But, you know, I felt I, it just, it, and it wasn't negative because she was so good about the whole thing. But you know what? That's how we got to be with God. God, I still want that blessing. I still want that wisdom. I still want to get those kids saved. I still want to get that kid healed. God, I still want to know about what I should do. You're just the right person for me. What? Tell me. Come on, God. Tell me. You know what God's doing? He's just waiting. God will wait. Here's how God is. Well, let's read it. Look what it says. Look what it says in verse 7. Hear what the unjust said. Ju- just unjust judge said. Shall God not avenge his own who elect who cry day and night, though he bears long with them? He'll bear along with you. He wants you to pray long. Because the longer you pray... The, long, the, the further into his den he can lure you. You know about the sea turtle. Sea turtle sitting on the bottom of the sea, and he has a little tongue. Looks like a little worm. He does it. You ever see that? You don't, you don't watch it on TV. It's Discovery Channel. He's like, and this little fish was over here looking at the worm. And he couldn't understand why no one else was going after the worm. Because he's like, and he's like, oh, that the worm looks all good. It's all juicy. Mm, I'm going to have it for breakfast. And he's looking around going, y'all want this worm? The other fish are like, nah, we ain't. Because they knew. They knew. It was a trap. <laughs> They're like, nah, you can have it, little fishy. So he was just swimming around looking at this worm. You could, and it was funny. You could see him swim, thinking. He was like, oh, no, swimming over here. He's looking over here. And the, and the sea turtle just. <laughs> and the sea turtle was pretty patient. He was like, I'm just going to wait. I'm just going to wait. And he, little, he just backed up a little bit, and this little fish kept going closer and closer and closer. Next thing you know, bam, he ate him. God is like, you want this? Come on, get it. That little five-minute praying ain't doing it. Come on. Ten minutes? Nope, come on. 
Come on. A week? Nope. A year? Nope. You know, I prayed for my father for years. I prayed for my father for years. Come on. I got time. You know why? God says, I got time because even if they die, I can raise them from the dead. Start over. I got time. I got time. But you want a new car? I got buses. I got time. <laughs> he wants you to pursue him pursue him because let me tell you something y'all in your pursuit of God he is going to transform you in your pursuit of God he is going to transform you that's the trick matter of fact the preacher was yesterday was talking about how we seek the hand of God instead of the face of God Stop asking God to do stuff for you and see God for who he is. Look him in his face. I look my kids in in the face. I just want to, I wish they were little again. When I see people with babies, they're holding their little babies. I used to hold my kids right here. I would have them by the leg like this right here, and their head would be here. I'd put them to sleep by doing this, and they would drool. I'd have the head hanging off. And they just slobber out that way. But I used to hold them like that and just walk them around, you know, at night when they would wake up. And now I try to do that. Their legs are all hanging this way, you know, so big. But that's, as dad, that's what I want. I still want them to be able to sit and look at me. Don't give me, give me. Just spend time with me. That's what God wants. He says, come to me. Turn to Genesis chapter 32, all the way in the beginning of the Bible. Genesis chapter 32. Genesis 32. In this story, Jacob is going to meet his brother Esau, and he had deceived his brother, and he's scared. And he sent his wives, his kids, his farmers, his animals to his brother ahead of him so his brother wouldn't be mad when he saw him. And the Bible says in verse 24, that after he sent everything ahead of him, he was left alone. And a man, the angel of the Lord, wrestled with him until the breaking of day. Prayer. And when he, the angel of the Lord saw that he did not prevail against Jacob, he touched the socket of his hip, and the socket of Jacob's hip was out of joint as he wrestled with him. And he said, let me go for day breaks, as the angel of the Lord said that. But Jacob said, I will not let you go unless you bless me. He said, what is your name? He said, Jacob. He said, your name shall no longer be called Jacob, but Israel. This is where Israel comes from. And he says, for you have struggled with God and man and have prevailed. Jacob had 12 sons. Those 12 sons are the nation of Israel, the 12 tribes of Israel, his 12 sons. He says, I'm not going to let you go. Until you bless me. Come on, man. Leave me alone. This is an angel. Leave me alone. Nope. He dislocated his hip. (laughs) He says, I'm in pain, but I'm not going to let you go. How many times have you prayed and something very simple would break your prayer? You're communicating with God Almighty. God has your undivided attention and the phone rings. Okay, God, I got to go. God has your undivided attention and you got this big colossal problem. Oh, God, I'm a little hungry. I got to go. Oh, you know, I, 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 I got to make sure I, I got my clothes in the dryer. No, 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 no. That's more important to you than me. You need to wrestle with God. You need to grab God and say, God, I ain't letting you go. I'm not letting you go. God, today, November 11th, today, November 11th, I'm going to grab you for an hour, and I'm not going to let you go. Tell God that. God, I talked to you a couple weeks ago about telling God you're getting to pray. God, I'm getting ready. I'm going to pray. Really, you're psyching your own self up. Here I come. Are you ready? 
Now, I got some stuff I want to talk to you about, and I, I'm going to, I got my Bible, I got my pen, my notebook, and I'm going to be here for a while. God's like, that's what I want to hear. Matter of fact, let's end with this. Get out your notes, and I want you to write something on here. Many of you know this acrostic or acronym, or, and I'm, but I'm going to give it to you anyway because I know many of you don't know this. On your notes, if you could look up here for a minute, just write A-W-C-I-P-A, or SIPA, down the left side of your paper. This is how you can pray for an hour very easily. A W C I P A. Un next to A, write the word admire. Admire. Spend five minutes thanking God, praising God, acknowledging all the good things God has done to you. Don't pray to him about anything else. Now, when you pray to God, it's very good to pray focused, one topic at a time. There was a, when I first started ministry, there was a, a couple of teenagers that lived next to my house, a 16 or 15-year-old boy and his sister. She was 14. And when she used to come over to my house and talk to me, um, she would ring the bell. She was like 70 pounds. She was the skinny little itty-bitty girl. And she would talk to me like this, um, uh, well, and, um, uh, uh, and I would sit there and look at her like this. <laughs> she was all over the map. Some of us pray like, God, like that to God. Dear God, I just want this, I don't know about this, and this person, and, and God's like, do you know what you're saying? <laughs> don't do that. Just pray in topics. First topic, admire God. Spend five or ten minutes thanking God. And, and let me say this. Get a ring notebook, and every day put the date on it, November 11th, put an A, and write everything out. Dear God, thank you for this. Thank you for this. Thank you for my mom. Thank you for where I grew up. Thank you for this. Thank you for the bad times or good times. Thank you for my church. Thank you for this. Thank you for that. Thank you for this. And write it out. Take your time. Take your time. Then W. Wait. Wait. The Bible says, be still and know that I am God. Psalm 4610. Write that out. Dear God, I want to be still. I want you to talk to me. I want to listen. I'm going to take a deep breath and relax. I'm going to cast my cares on you. Wait. C is confess. Write that one down. Confess. And this is where it's going to get funky. Don't write down, dear God, forgive me, and then move on. Dear God, I said something yesterday I shouldn't have said. I thought something yesterday I shouldn't have thought. I watched a television show, a movie, a video, a magazine some music that I shouldn't have done. My decision, my comment was motivated by jealousy, lust, pride, arrogance. Don't think that if you don't acknowledge your sin, God can't get you for it. <laughs> you know, people say, well, if I write it, then I'm going to be guilty, and then I'm, oh, no. If you write it and acknowledge it, you are opening yourself up to being forgiven. If you hold it in your heart, you're just denying it, and you're, that's worse. Write it out. Dear God, forgive me for this thought about this person at this time. Da -da 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 -da. Ooh. And then pray, dear God, I hope no one reads this. <laughs> <laughs> then you write an I. Intercede. Pray for other people. This is work. Prayer is work. Dear God, I pray for my wife, my husband, my kids, my parents, my neighbors, my coworkers, my employees, my employers, my competition, my enemies, the president. I pray for Osama, bin Laden. Lord, I know the government don't know where he is, but I know you know where he is. Isn't that amazing? That brother can be not, how can we not know where that dude is? And he's given videos and faxes. How is that possible? We are the most developed world in the nation, in the, in the developed nation in the world. And this brother's in a cave laughing. Lord, you know where he's at. 
get him. <laughs> you know, just get him. I don't know. Get him saved. Get him out. Get him something. But get him. <laughs> Lord, we pray for the, the Christians that are being held by the Taliban. We pray for go to a hospital and walk the halls and pray for people. Go to the hospital and ask people why they're there. And tell me, I'll pray for them. And have people tell you, my little son, two years old, yesterday we were in the hospital when I was there last night. I don't know the age, boy's age. Got hit in the head with a baseball bat and his skull's cracked open. What's your problem? You can't get a car? This kid's fighting for his life? Go pray for people. Say, can I pray for you? People will let you pray for them. Pray for them. Intercede. You want a ministry? Pray. Pray for me. I need prayer. Pray for me. If you don't know what to say, just say, God, give him wisdom. Give him rest. Pray that I can have rest. Turn his mind off. Okay? I, and then a P. Petition. Pray for yourself. Now, you know, this is the hour right there. Okay, God, this is the part I'm real good at. God, I need wisdom. Solomon was the most wise man ever to live. He was the richest man ever to live, the Bible says. But when God told, asked, told him, Solomon, you can ask anything you want. You know what he asked for? Wisdom. Give me wisdom. That's what he asked for. He didn't ask for money. He didn't ask for women. He asked for wisdom. He gave him wisdom. A-W-C-I-P-A. A, admire God, thank him again. Just thank him, say, Lord, thank you for this time I got to spend with you. Thank you that I have breath in my lungs. Thank you my mind works. Thank you that I'm saved. You want to spend an hour in prayer? Go someplace, tie yourself to the chair, and say, I'm not leaving until I get through all supper. Now, let me tell you something. I'm going to tell you something. It's gospel truth. Please trust me. If you do that, and if you do it every day, your life will be unexplainable. You'll be like this. Oh, you just, I, people ask you about stuff. You say, I, I, I just can't explain it. I, I, ah. You won't be able to explain it. And here's what I'm going to challenge you. Let's try this. Do it for 15 minutes today. That's like three minutes a letter. That's nothing. Just do it three, 15 minutes. Write the letter. Write your prayer. Put your watch on for three minutes, and I promise you, you'll go longer. And then go to the next one. And go to the next one. Next thing you know, 30 minutes will go by, and you'll be like, and then ask yourself, where are you going? What do you got to do that's better? Oh, I got I to I watch ESPN. <laughs> I, I got to go to the store. I got to go do laundry. You know what? I don't have anything to do that's better. You don't. Pray. A long time, all the time. And I'm going to end with this. The devil works overtime to consume your time. Don't let him win. Because just like Osama Bilal in some cave laughing at us, laughing, them fools will know what they're doing. So the devil's laughing at us. Look at them. Watch me. Watch me. Watch me get them to stop praying. Call your friend up. Your phone rings. Put a little gurgle in the stomach. Make him think he's going to die if he don't get a sandwich right now. <laughs> Remind him of uh, some episode of Friends he wants to see, uh, you know, Steve Harvey or something. Tell him about the football game. Tell him about the highlights he needs to see for the fifth time today. <laughs> They're so stupid. Some Christians are so stupid. They don't pray. Don't be guilty of that. Let's bow our heads right now. Lord, I pray that we would pray a long time. We can't 
trust you any further than we know you. And the degree that we know you is directly related to the time we spend with you. I pray we would spend time with you. Lord, I thank you that I know you good enough to know you can heal Garrett's eye. And we ask you to do that. That you would do the unexplainable. I know you well enough to know you can prompt people today to pray. I just pray they would listen to you. They wouldn't ignore it. They wouldn't think that, that they're just thinking about it because they're just remembering the sermon, that they would acknowledge that the Holy Spirit is speaking to them later on today, tomorrow, a week from now, a month from now. Lord, rearrange our lives that we may spend time with you. Thank you. In Jesus' name, amen. Before you move, I want you to pay close attention whenever you come here and hear stories about stuff that happens, like that crusade, like the building, keep praying for that, and other stuff that we're going to do. I want you to pay close attention to what God and how God is doing all that. It's not us doing it. And the only way that God does what he does is that someone's praying. It's not only me. We got a bunch of people praying. And when you see that stuff happening, don't think that it's automatic. Oh, we're in ministry. We just do it. It doesn't happen that way. It's the favor of God. If that crusade stuff was automatic, there'd be a whole bunch of people doing it. And a whole bunch of people are not doing it. It's because of God. That's what God told us to do. And the reason I want you to pay attention is because if you see stuff like that happening and you see all this stuff happening on behalf of the church or the ministry, I, I want you to believe that it can happen to you in your life. It's not just for me or the church. It's for you. You have to believe that. Because if you believe it, if you don't believe that, then why do you come? Because it doesn't do you any good to cheer me on. That doesn't make any sense. You, you have to do it. So you have to believe that God wants to do miracles in your life that you cannot explain, that are just out there miracles. I was at this thing yesterday, and my, my job at the prayer and fasting event in L.A. was to inspire, encourage people to pray for kids. And one of the things I said about kids is that kids, there's three things about, well, three things I point out about kids. They're teachable. They have fearless faith, little kids. But they also dream. Little kids can dream. What do you want to be when you grow up? I want to be a doctor. I want to be a lawyer. I want to be the president. All in the same time. We don't dream. Because we're old. We're mature. We know that's not realistic. God says, that's your problem. I want you to become like a child. So when you hear me say, talking about all this stuff, you go, man, it ain't going to happen. Well, that ain't going to happen to you. But he wants you to believe that he can do anything. And he wants you to believe it. He says, hey, I want you to go do this. You go, ha, ha, ha. just go do it. Don't, don't, just go do it. Walk with me by faith. Take me by the hand. I'll lead you. So when you get on your knees and pray, you have to pray with no limits. No ifs, ands, and buts. Lord, let's do this. That's what God likes. Remember Shadrach, Meshach, and Benny going to go fire? All they had to do was bow, not to go into fire. You know, God was fired up. He says, man, those dudes are faithful. Those dudes put it on the line. Therefore, Jesus, get down there. Whew. That's what you want. So go home and pray and say, God, let's see, let's see what's going to happen. See what's going to happen. Amen? We're going to sing a song. I'm going to try to get down this aisle.